So a couple years back, my buddies and I tried to stay the night in the park after closing time. Our plan was to just take pictures, you know, nothing sinister or anything like that. We just, we wanted to be able to say that we did it, you know? So basically we snuck from bathroom to bathroom, corner to corner, and we managed to stay here until they closed the gates and the maintenance team got to work. And we were really surprised we hadn't gotten caught. It was, you know, almost strange, considering how much talking up Disney's security gets. Our hearts were beating like crazy, and we sat there for a while, hiding behind a tombstone by the haunted mansion. We noticed that it's true. The Disney Imagineers had signed their names on every single one. So, finally, we got the courage to roam around, still being careful as to not be seen. It was really eerie. You know, the occasional guard or maintenance worker would walk by, and we could just duck or hide behind a corner. And it worked. For about half an hour... Of course, we couldn't keep this up for long, and yeah, they caught us. I mean, give us props for even attempting and succeeding. But that's not where the story ends. So the first thing we said when they caught us was, Are you going to take us down to the dungeon? And we laughed. The security guard chuckled too, so the mood wasn't too dreary. He told us we weren't the first people to try and sneak in after hours, but he wanted to know how we did it. So we explained the situation, and he actually laughed, said that it wasn't a bad plan. He told us that he had to take us to the Disney jail to be further interrogated, which we thought was odd, but we figured from the beginning that if we had gotten caught, they'd take us down there. I mean, it might have been our plan all along. Maybe we wanted to see the Disney catacombs, one thing we wanted to be in the park after hours. So we called for more workers to come help and escort us, and we went on our way towards Toontown. Then they took us down in this elevator right into hell the first thing we noticed was how expensive looking the elevator was I don't know if this makes sense but it's hard to explain it was like a stainless steel interior with mirrors all around and the floor was this tacky red carpet but it looked expensive there were only two buttons in this elevator not counting the emergency buttons one said up, the other said down I had forgotten to mention that they never handcuffed us or zip-tied our hands. They just kind of walked beside us, expecting that we'd follow. Not that we would have tried to make a run for it. I mean, these people seemed decent. Like, how were we supposed to know what was going to happen? The elevator stopped, and we started walking down this perfectly shining, bleach-smelling corridor. There were no doors on either side. It was just a plain, empty corridor. We walked for what seemed like an eternity and no one was talking any longer. It was me, my friends, the security guard, and two other maintenance workers. Finally, we reached a heavy metal door, one that had a security code and a card reader. One worker put his card in, the other typed a code on the keypad. I watched the code he typed in, 121566. I only remember it because I found out later what its significance was. And it makes me laugh, looking back. It's strange. It's strange that I could laugh looking back. They led me and my friends into another corridor. This one had doors down the hallway, except each door had a little plexiglass square, a 10 by 10 inch window at the top right corner. It looked sort of like a psych ward, to be honest, not, not much like a jail. He led us to room 1901, and inside was a single desk with, surprisingly, three chairs for me and each of my friends. Then they left us in there alone, closing the door on the way out. We sat in the chairs like obedient little children, and we we waited for them to return, but... But they never did. Two hours went by, and no one came back for us. My buddy Tim went to the door, and surprisingly, it was unlocked. He didn't open it, though. He was worried there'd be a guard on the outside and they'd think that we were escaping. We weren't looking for any trouble. So about 25 minutes went by, and we got restless and finally decided to leave the room. The hallway was empty like before, no signs of people, nothing. We started calling out, Hello? Anybody there? No one answered our calls. We noticed surveillance cameras were placed above every door. 
I mean, got to wondering if there was any living souls in this place at all. We should have left right then and there, but then again, whoever does the right thing in these kinds of situations... Now, every door looked the same, and each one had a specific number above it. They weren't in order, like, say, room 1 through 10. They were scattered numbers. For example, our room had been 1901, but the door next to it was 1205. We got to thinking and finally assumed they were just randomly chosen. We walked up that hallway and had no idea where we were going, what we were hoping to find, or even if it mattered. My other buddy, Guy, decided that we should just leave. He said that if they really wanted us here, they'd, they'd come back and maybe it was just a scare tactic. Maybe they just wanted to trick us into thinking that we were being arrested and, and were waiting for us outside to laugh. I felt weary of the whole situation and Tim was just... He was just quiet the whole time, nodding his head here and there. He was more interested in looking in the door's little 10 by 10 inch windows. And that wasn't a good idea. I tried to tell him, of course. No one listens to reason when they're freaked out. And we were definitely freaked the fuck out at this point. The cameras above the doors were capable of motion detection and followed us as we wandered down the desolate corridor. A little red light at the bottom of the lens, blinking each second. No noise filled the air. All we heard was each other's breathing. And then it happened. We reached the end of the hallway. Unfortunately, the door at the end had another pin code reader. I, I tried the pin from before, the one that I saw him type in, but it was invalid. At that moment, the lights in the hallway shut off, and we heard the doors. God, God damn it, I could, I could still hear them to this day. The fucking doors open. All lining up along the corridor, they made a subtle creak, and then boom as they hit the wall beside them with force. As I said, after I entered the invalid code in the keypad, the light shut off, the doors opened, except for the door with the keypad. We all noticed as the doors opened, each doorway had a little bit of light seeping from its open pathway. We stood there stunned for a good five minutes, not knowing what to do. And we figured we'd trip some alarm. That this was just, just a protocol. A standard drill in case of any attempted escape. I mean, what were we supposed to think? So we turned the other direction, away from the locked door. A sense of panic hit all three of us for some reason, and we got the urge to run. Nobody agreed to running. It was like it was like we all knew that we had to at the same time. Some sort of instinct, like a like a baby gazelle knowing when to run from a lion. And we were in a lion's den, all right. It wasn't until after the tenth door we passed that we began to look into the doorways as we passed them. Standing at the doorways were people in costumes. We, we were running past Donald's, Mickey's, Goofy's, Pluto's, all different kinds of Disney characters. He was insane, and we screamed at the top of our lungs. I know they say never look behind you as you run, but I did. They were leaving the rooms, and, and they were following us. They were not running. They were just casually walking towards us. I think that's what made it more terrifying. Almost like they knew that we had nowhere to go. Now, I don't know if it was all in my head. Okay? I, or maybe it was just the sheer panic and the, the fear of the moment, but I swear. I swear on my mother's life. I heard it's a small world playing over an intercom. I, had, I have this fear of dolls, and the ride always gave me the creeps my whole life. And now I, I could see them. The little robotic dolls standing in the doorways as we passed, still following with the costume characters. The dolls, they weren't chasing us, thank God. I mean, I could have died from a heart attack if I had seen the dolls following. But they didn't. It didn't make the situation all that better. I mean, how many times have you been followed by a group of costume individuals seemingly out to fucking eat you alive? At least, that's what I told myself to keep myself moving. Stopping meant being devoured by, by fucking Donald Duck. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't... I don't want to go out like that. Tim was crying. Guy was sweating and breathing heavily, and I just kept turning my head to see if we were still being followed. And of course, we were. Now, I'm not sure how many doors we had passed at this point, or if there really were different characters at each door, but I knew that this hallway had to end at some point, and we were getting the fuck out of this place pronto. Easier said than done. I looked back after another minute or two of running and noticed there was nothing behind us anymore, and nothing that we could see. I heard footsteps, but figured that we had gotten so far ahead that they were just still walking casually like before. The hallway was still going on for what seemed like forever, and Guy needed to stop or he was going to faint from exhaustion. The door beside us was open, with lights on, but nothing inside. I decided we'd hide in there until we caught our breaths, and we can continue onward. 
As we closed the door behind us, I noticed the room was 1966. Again, nothing at the time. Tim was pacing the room. Guy was laying on the floor, still breathing pretty hard, and I was at the window looking out. I saw nothing. No more music. No, nothing. It was dark out. Hard to tell for sure, but I figured that I would have seen figures, shadows, something. Still, I kept watch. After 15 minutes or so, Guy said that he was good to go. Tim was the only one smart enough to pull out his new Razor cell phone. No signal, of course. He opened the door subtly, quietly, but he heard no footsteps. Nothing was following us anymore. But we weren't taking any chances. We got back to running. It only took us another seven minutes to reach the door, give or take. It had no keypad, and it was open. We entered the corridor from before, and thank God there were no doors. We ran for the elevator and got in, pushed the up button, and stood there looking at each other, dumbfounded, as to what had just happened. None of us spoke. We just waited till the elevator opened back up in Toontown and started, started making our way for the front gate. We kept a low profile, using the same duck-and-hide technique that had gotten us this far, from the get-go. Maintenance workers and security guards were still about, but we couldn't take any more chances. Finally, Tim lost it and took off in a sprint. I couldn't imagine what had set him off until I looked, and I saw that everyone in the park just... just stood there, staring at us. The blank faces. We heard voices over the intercom explaining the three fugitives had escaped from captivity and needed to be escorted back into the jails below. We booked it, Catching up to Tim, costume characters appeared from the shadows, workers, guards, chasing after us. Everyone was sprinting for us. I, I couldn't see well, but I imagined drool dripping from their jowls. They wanted us back down there. We, we had escaped, and they were pissed. The gate was just up ahead. The creepiest thing about it all was that besides the voice over the intercom, the park was death silent. No, no chat from the workers could be heard. Not, and even now, as we were running for what seemed like our lives... From the characters, the workers, the guards, no one bothered to shout after us. No one yelled. No one said stop. Nothing. Just footsteps and the occasional cough from Guy. As we made it past the park's front gate, we didn't stop until we got to the parking lot. Our car was gone. We were left scratching our heads. We continued running down the road, which went on for miles, stopping occasionally for us to catch our breaths. We made it to a little corner store, where Tim used his cell to call a taxi cab. When we finally arrived, we took the cab back to the hotel we were staying at, paid the fare, went up to our rooms. And in the end, the next day, we got a call from the hotel's front desk. So we headed downstairs. There were officers waiting for us. They said our car had been impounded. We needed to pay the fine. They didn't ask us any other questions. and We didn't bother telling the police anything that had happened. Even now, on this random board, people who don't have a reason to disbelieve me don't believe me. So how could an officer of the law be expected to? We didn't bother. We simply paid the fine and drove home. We didn't talk about what happened. The whole drive back, it wasn't until a couple weeks later that I got myself to search up the numbers. Curiosity, I guess. As you know, Walt Disney was born December 5th, 1901. And the room we were in was 1901. The door next to it was 12.05. And also, he died December 15th, 1966, which was the key code the worker had put in to lead us into the main corridor. That's a strange coincidence, I decided. Whether any of that was real at all, I couldn't tell you. I mean, maybe our imaginations ran wild. We were tired. It was around 1 a.m. when we made our escape, so it's plausible that that's the answer. I'll never forget it, though. And I haven't been back since. Good evening, kids. It's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and I wanted to tell you thank you so much for watching tonight's video. If you guys take a look in the description down below, you'll find some neat stuff. Particularly, I use a lot of links there that'll take you over to the author's reddits, as well as if the author has written any kinds of books or you'd like to find more from any of the authors that we've done stories for, you can find their info in the description. I know it's not very YouTube-like to look down there, but I'd really appreciate it if you did. And of course, I want to give a very, very, very big shout out to all of my followers on Patreon, especially Bloodlace, Peter Bowie, Acid System, F, Alan Hyper, 
Brennan Matthews, Mary Massacre, Janine Hook, Paul Livingston, Seth Joseph Richards, Ashlyn, Did I Nick, Azad Hosenbuckus, Rick Dance, Bryce Charles, Luminan Walker, Sherry Morgan, Jake McNee, Victoria Helton, BDH9294, Melinda S, Finney, Nathan, Dante Rao, Jane Reynolds, Ace Band G, Ryan Kellum, Bobby J. Cavanaugh, Barbara Biggs, Bella Bailey, Ninja Grace, Dead Obsessed Trash, Suzanne Groh, Tommy Walters, Tater Chip, Onbu Op Willie, Sarah Gree, Yuri Katzlash, Randy, Brad Gustafson, Sean Tristan Markham, B. Lisa Tyser, Jose Rodriguez, Adagio Rose, Peaceful Buddha, Azarine Fox, Freddy Krueger, Ho Gunkchi, Justin Johnson, King Hades F13, Michael Scarborough, James Lowe, Someone You Love, Nina Smith, Rafael Rodriguez, and Chance Burnett. You guys, as always, are the real MVP, and I can't thank you enough for helping me get to where I am now and, you know, generally keeping me alive. So thank you all so much for supporting on Patreon. Thank you, everybody, in the description for supporting on Patreon. And thank you, everybody out there who's listening and watching somewhere across the many reaches of the Internet. Have a good night and sweet dreams.